Hello everybody and welcome back to another video on the channel. It has been a couple of days now since the AFL trade period ended this year and I thought I'd just make a video recapping the whole thing and uh, giving my thoughts on how well each team did in my opinion. So yeah, I think without further ado we should get into this, um, there's a lot to talk about. So first up is obviously the Adelaide Crows, there wasn't a whole lot of action this trade period for them. They really had one goal going into this trade period and they achieved that. So looking at who arrived and who left, we can see that obviously Isaac Rankin arrived. Uh, that was their main objective. Uh, they got rid of Billy Frampton, not too big of a loss there. They got a third round future pick for that, so I think that's pretty good compensation. I don't think he's worth any more than that. But yeah, so they don't have a lot of draft picks this year, but I don't think that's really what their focus is now. They've built up their team on draft picks over the last few years and I think they've done it pretty well and now they'll be looking to climb up the ladder in the next few years. So yeah, pretty solid trade period for the Crows. They got a pretty good recruit in Isaac Rankin and if anything got overcompensated for Billy Frampton. So yeah, I have to give them a B plus, uh, achieved everything they set out to do and got one of their better recruits in a while. Brisbane had a pretty active trade period, there was a lot of players joining and leaving the club, uh, all the while that Brisbane were trying to get enough draft picks and enough draft points to make a bid on father-son prospect Will Ashcroft, so yeah, a lot to unpack. This trade period, Brisbane welcomed Jack Gunston and arguably the biggest name of the trade period, Josh Dunkley. Uh, Tom Berry and Dan McStay both left, however I don't think that'll hurt them too much as Dan McStay will be replaced by arguably better Jack Gunston and Tom Berry wasn't getting many games at the club anyway. They obviously have a lot of draft picks, particularly in the second round this year uh, because they wanted to try and bid on Will Ashcroft who was likely to go at pick number one otherwise. So yeah, I think it's been a very successful trade period for the Lions. They really did everything they wanted and needed to do. I can't give Brisbane anything other than A+. It was an absolute brilliant trade period. They did everything they possibly could have. They got the reigning Bulldogs best and fairest winner in Josh Dunkley. They got a direct replacement for Dan McStay, who's arguably better. And they still have enough draft points for Will Ashcroft, so I, I don't really think they could have done anything else. They have to get an A+. So in previous years, Carlton had been very proactive, been chasing a lot of different players. This year, they were a bit quieter. However, they did still complete a few deals. So as you can see here, the only real movements that happened were Blake Akers moving into the club and Will Setterfield moving out of the club. Uh, Blake Akers got done pretty early on, so after that there wasn't a whole lot of dealing to be done. Will Setterfield was out of favour at Carlton, so not a big loss there. And Yeah, I think overall fairly successful, but not a lot happened. And for that, I will be giving them a B grade. Uh, they got a wingman, which they really did need, and I think their list is now good enough to carry them forward, so no other deals really needed to be completed. Next up we have Collingwood, who were one of the busiest teams this trade period. Uh, we knew for a while that they would be. Uh, a lot of players coming in and out of the club, um, just a lot of ha stuff happening. So as you can see here, there are a lot of revivals at Collingwood this season. Tom Mitchell, Dan McStay, Bobby Hill and Billy Frampton. You'd think at least two of those would go straight into the best 22. Bobby Hill maybe not and Billy Frampton definitely not. Uh, Brody Grundy and Ollie Henry left. Uh, Ollie Henry uh, left on his own merit, while Brody Grundy effectively got pushed out of the club because his salary was just too much to pay for, so I mean you're never going to win those trades. Um, they don't have a lot of draft picks this year because of how much trading they had to do, but uh, yeah, so that was the trade period for Collingwood, very eventful. So for all the action, I'm going to be giving Collingwood a B plus. The only thing stopping me from giving them an A minus or an A is the fact that they had to get rid of Brody Grundy for only pick 27 on the basis that he was taking up too much salary space. But other than that, it was a pretty successful and eventful trade period for Collingwood. Now moving on to Essendon, uh, not a whole lot happened here, uh, so we'll go over this one pretty quickly. So as you can see here, this trade period, they brought in Will Setterfield and Sam Wiedemann, both out of 
favour at their own clubs. Uh, Aaron Francis, who himself was out of favour at Essendon left, uh, they have picks 4, 22, 54, 62, 68 and 72. So I think they did a pretty reasonable job um, this trade period. They, they brought in a couple of players uh, who potentially have more chances of getting games than they do at their previous clubs and Aaron Francis is definitely not a big loss. I'm going to be giving Essendon a B, I think, uh, despite not doing a whole lot compared to some other clubs, I think they got some handy acquisitions. Uh, Sam Wiedemann is more likely to get games than he was at Melbourne. I think he could potentially have almost a bit of a breakout year next year. Will Satterfield uh, for some midfield depth, I think they really did need some good midfield depth and they're going to get that in Will Setterfield. and yeah, just overall a pretty decent but at the same time quiet trade period. Now moving on to a club that was very active this trade period, uh, among the most active clubs this trade period, that was Fremantle. Uh, there was many big name recruits both joining and leaving this club. Uh, there was a lot of speculation about how this trade period would go for Fremantle even during the year, so yeah, there's, there's a lot to talk about here. So as we can see here, there was a lot of movement. Uh, Josh Corbett, Luke Jackson and Jago Romero joined the club, while Blake Akers, Rory Lobb, Griffin Logue, Lloyd Meek and Darcy Tucker left. Um, as for the players that joined, Josh Corbett I think is going to be a very handy player for them. He wasn't getting many games at the Suns, they got him pretty cheaply, however I think in a very depleted forward line at Fremantle, particularly the key forwards, uh, he could play a very useful role. Luke Jackson, uh, they were obviously planning on getting him all year, it was very much talked about throughout the year. Um, he'll play a bit of a ruck forward midfield hybrid role, sort of like Mark Blitzars, um, going to be very good for them, uh, should fill a lot of voids in their team and Jago Romero was a last minute uh, pickup. No one really expected that deal to happen. No one really even knew about the possibility of a deal like that happening but it did. Uh, so he'll come in just pretty much for a straight swap for David Mundy who retired. Uh, as for who left, I don't think there's too many really big names. Rory Lobb, um, he was probably their most important player that left but with Luke Jackson coming in I think sort of counts, cancels it out. Uh, Darcy Tucker, not that important. Blake, Ake, Blake Akers, he was definitely a handy player for them. I don't know if they're going to really sorely miss him uh, much, but I think they probably would have rather keep him, but I don't know. I don't know how important of a loss he'll be. Griffin Logue, uh, he, was, he was a handy player, but I don't think he's a catastrophic loss. And also Lloyd Meek, uh, who was a bit of ruck depth, but is now left because, uh, well, wasn't getting too many games. Uh, that could be a bit of a loss if one of their ruckmen do get injured. So after all that, I'm going to give Fremantle an A-. minus. They got their main target in Luke Jackson. They got Josh Corbett, who will be a handy player in my opinion. And they also, at the last minute, got Jago Romero, who's going to be a very... Uh, important player to replace David Mundy. I think that was a brilliant pickup by then. If it wasn't for the Jager Amira deal, I'd probably only give them a B plus due to how many players they lost, but because of that, I'll give them an A minus. So up next, uh, we're talking about Geelong. Uh, you think the reigning premiers wouldn't be doing a lot of trades, but they actually were fairly active this trade period, and uh, there's there is a fair bit to talk about. So as you can see here, they got a few youngsters in Jack Bowles, Ollie Henry and Tanner Bruin. They got rid of uh, Cooper Stevens. However, the big thing that they secured was this year's pick seven. Uh, obviously, everyone knows about the story now of how Gold Coast uh, were paying Jack Bowles something crazy like 800000 a year. And because of their uh, salary cap issues, they just couldn't pay for him. So they needed to offer him up. However, in order to get anyone to pay his salary, they also needed to give, give away pick seven. Uh, Geelong snapped that up after he requested a trade to Geelong. So now they have pick seven. Um, they basically gave up nothing in return, only a future third. 
Uh, so yeah, they got they got multiple youngsters as well as one of the top draft picks this year. It defies logic what Geelong have been able to do after winning a premiership. You'd think that the premiership winning side would do basically nothing. They uh, wouldn't be able to get high draft picks, but Geelong have done all of that. It's just been incredible. So like Brisbane, I'm going to be giving Geelong an A+. I think uh, they have to get an A+, with everything they managed after winning a premiership. Premiership winning side just shouldn't be able to have this good of a trade period, and they did. So yeah, A+. Now to a club we just talked about when uh, bringing up a previous trade involving Geelong as well. Uh, this, this club really wasn't in the trade period for any of the right reasons. They were talked about, but not in a good way. So as you can see here, Gold Coast picked up Tom Berry and Ben Long, both players that I don't really think will be in their best 22 side. Uh, ben Long maybe, but Tom Berry definitely not. He'll be a fringe player. Uh, who left? Jack Bowles, Josh Corbett, and the big name Isaac Rankin. But of course, as I brought up before, they also lost uh, pick seven because they were just way overpaying Jack Bowers and they couldn't afford it. They don't even have many draft picks this year. Yeah, it was just an all round horrible trade period for them. I, I don't see any positives here really. So this may be an unpopular one, but I'm gonna give the Suns an E. I think they did the worst this trade period. A lot of me, a lot of people have been talking about how Hawthorne didn't really do well. They thought they did the worst. Well, I think it's the Suns because look, they, nothing went right for the Suns. At least Hawthorne made one good recruitment, but the Suns, nothing. They, there was nothing, absolutely nothing to celebrate for the two Suns fans that exist. So GWS now, they were also in the discussion of the trade period for a lot of the wrong reasons, um, which we'll go over in a second. So as you can see here, there were a lot of players departing the Giants this year. Um, they only got one player in return in Toby Bedford, however I think that is a bit of an underrated pickup. Uh, I think he probably will slot into the best 22, especially with Bobby Hill leaving. Uh, as for the names that left, uh, Bobby Hill was one, obviously. There was also Tanner Bruin, Jacob Hopper, and Tim Taranto, uh, each of which I think, well, uh, Jacob Hopper and Tim Taranto were definitely best 22. Uh, Tanner Bruin and Bobby Hill were sort of on the lower end. Um, but despite all of those players leaving, I don't think it was all bad, as they did get some pretty good compensation, uh, as you can see here. They actually hold pick 1, 15, 18, and 19 in the top 20, so that's a pretty good draft hand. However, there's no guarantee that all of those players are going to be stars. Um, so while it is very good compensation, uh, it's still not the best trade period for GWS, um, and it's just not a good look, all of these players leaving at once, um, especially with their track record. So I will be giving GWS a D plus uh, as a result of all of their players leaving. They did get a bit of pretty decent compensation, so that saved them from getting a D minus or a D. But yeah, not a good look. All these players leaving. Now moving on to Hawthorne, who were a big player in this trade period, not for all the right reasons though. Um, obviously, there was a bit of a mini player exodus right at the end, and we'll go over that now. Hawks trade period started off pretty well. They made the first deal of the free agency period, recruiting Carl Amon, uh, who filled a wingman void, which they definitely did need a wingman. Uh, they, but from there, it pretty much all went downhill. And on the final day, uh, they had both Tom Mitchell and Jager O'Meara leave in return for Lloyd Meek, uh, Cooper Stevens, and a couple of draft picks. But yeah, they, they ended up losing more than they gained in this trade period, which didn't look like it would be the case at the start. They also lost Jack Gunson, a uh, pretty handy forward for them. So yeah, not, not the best. It started off well, finished off disastrously. So I'm going to be giving the Hawks a D because they really, really messed it up on the final day. Uh, it looked like it was going okay, the trade period. They Nothing really special, but... Uh, then both Tom Mitchell and Jager Amira left um, 
leaving their midfield very inexperienced. Their best midfielder next year is going to be a 22-year-old by the name of Jai Newcomb. So extremely inexperienced and I, yeah, this will hurt them next year, definitely. Moving on to Melbourne now, a uh, fairly eventful trade period for them. The last day in particular was quite eventful. They uh, got a number of deals done um, and even the day before that they got quite a few deals done. So yeah. So as you can see here, many players on this screen right now that both joined and left. Uh, they got Brody Grundy, that was the big one. They got him fairly cheaply because Collingwood was doing a salary dump. Uh, they also got Lockie Hunter and Josh Shackey, uh, probably fringe players. Or Lockie Hunter, they're saying, will be best 22, but Shackey, I think, will be more or less a fringe player. They lost Luke Jackson, Sam Wiedemann, Toby Bedford, and also Jaden Hunt. Uh... I feel like they definitely got more than they lost here. They got pretty good compensation for Luke Jackson. Toby Bedford wasn't getting many full games. He was being used as the medical sub or just not playing. Sam Wiedemann the same. Jaden Hunt, a uh, bit of a loss, but I don't think it'll be catastrophic. But yeah, Brody Grundy and Max Gorn next year in the Ruck, that is going to be... If Grundy can stay fit, that'll be one of the best Ruck combos of all time. Melbourne, I'll be giving an A-. Uh, like I said, they got now the best ruck combo, or one of the best ruck combinations of all time. Uh, got pretty good conversation for Luke Jackson, just a very good trade period all round, I think. North Melbourne were a team that were in the headlines this trade period for many different reasons, for right and for wrong. Um, yeah, there was a lot of action down at Arden Street. A lot of players leaving, a lot of players joining, a lot of pick swapping going on. Uh, they were even involved in one of the biggest deals of all time, uh, involving number one picks being traded. Yeah, it was very hectic for North Melbourne. So as you can see here, Griffin Logue, Darcy Tucker arrived. Jason Horn Francis, last year's number one pick after only one season at the club left. Um, so on paper, when you look at that, it doesn't look like they're did much although they were involved like I said in that big four-way deal they got rid of their pick one this year for picks two and three um, got rid of uh, Jason Horn Francis personally I actually think they did pretty well in that deal Jason Horn Francis clearly didn't want to be there they weren't going to get anything out of him uh, if he stayed there because he probably would have had another just mediocre year and his draft or sorry his trade value would have gone down so I think they did pretty well in that deal to get everything they could out of the deal uh, I'd take picks two and three over pick one this year as well anyway so and I think Griffin Logue and Darcy Tucker should be good inclusions uh, for their side so a lot of people have been dumping on North Melbourne for this trade period been saying they did very poorly I don't think they did I'm gonna give them a B plus I think they did very well at winning um, out of the Jason Horn Francis trade uh, Griffin Logue and Darcy Tucker, they're both going to be good pickups for them. I think they did very well, to be honest. Um, so yeah, this one may come as a bit surprising, but yeah, North Melbourne, B+. Uh, it's the first time in a while that they've really done anything good, so good job, North Melbourne. On to Port Adelaide now, a club that was heavily involved with dealings with North Melbourne, obviously, because of Jason Horn Francis, and yeah, they were particularly in the final few days they were very active in this trade period so obviously the big deal that happened was uh they got jason horn francis and junior rioli uh they had to give up a fair number of draft picks as a result they only have picks 33 and 60 this year they did also lose carl amon in the first deal of this trade period so uh didn't come without a cost uh this trade period but yeah um Personally, I think this was a bit overrated of uh, a trade period for Port Adelaide. A lot of people are talking up as they were one of the outright uh, unanimous winners, but personally, I don't think that. I think it was a bit overrated. So this is going to be an unpopular one, I know, but really, uh, I, I think they paid overs to get Jason Horn Francis and Junior Rioli. Uh, it was definitely a pass, but considering they also lost Carl Amon, I... I really don't think it was that big of a pass, to be honest. Next up, we'll be looking at the Richmond Tigers, a pretty active team in this year's trade period. 
uh, they secured a couple of big names, um, put them on big contracts, and yeah, those, they were in amongst a fair few deals. So Richmond entered this trade period with two names in mind, that being Jacob Hopper and Tim Taranto. Uh, they got both of them, they had to give up a fair few draft picks in order to get them. Uh, they didn't have to give up any players though, it was thought that they'd perhaps give up Ivan Soldo, but that never eventuated, so they didn't lose anyone and they gave Jacob Hopper and Tim Taranto and put them both on 7 year deals. I think it's a bit much, but you know, that they, they at least got them for, and I think it'll definitely benefit them in the short term. Um, so yeah, Richmond, two big names, uh, should be fired up and ready to go for next year. So fairly simple grade I think, uh, I'd give them an A, they got both the targets they wanted and they are pretty good players, um, they gave up a fair amount of draft picks but I don't think they really needed any draft picks, I think their list is capable of, of going deep into finals next year, uh, potentially a premiership, I think unlikely but uh, I, I don't think it's completely impossible. St Kilda now and probably one of the least active teams really, they didn't do much at all, um, they haven't really done anything in the trade periods for quite a number of years now, they've been, they've always been one of the most boring trade period sides, um, yeah, they're just sort of in no man's land really, St Kilda. So as you can see here, they got rid of Ben Long and got Zane Cordy this trade period. Ben Long, I don't think is too important for them. I've heard some St Kilda supporters say he was a decent player, but I don't think he will hurt them that much. Zane Cordy, he's just for a bit of depth, um, a backup player. I think their best 22 back line is pretty decent, so I don't think he'll slot straight into that. But uh, yeah, it's just bit of a nothing trade period again for the Saints, they don't have a particularly strong draft hand, yeah, I mean, that's more or less what we're accustomed to with St Kilda. So D plus for the Saints, um, look, they didn't do a whole lot, but I think, frankly, I don't think their list is that good, They've, their managers and everything are coming out and saying they're confident that their list is capable of better, but I'm just not sure it is. Uh, they their list is well I mean it's quite just average and they seem to think that they can just get away with doing nothing in off seasons but I don't really see how they can possibly think that with many years of mediocrity um, so yeah D plus for St Kilda they needed to do more I had a couple of targets in mind early but didn't get any of them um, and ended up just really doing nothing and I don't think that's a good thing for them. Next up is Sydney, who were the single least active team this trade period. Uh, so I'm just going to pretty much skip straight to their grade. They get a C. Um, they didn't do anything, but I think they're, with their list, they didn't need to do anything. They brought in Aaron Francis effectively for free. They gave up pick 37, but also got pick 42 um, as well with that trade. So. Yeah, they pick up one fringe player for free. Uh, other than that, they didn't do anything. But again, their list, I don't think they really needed to do anything. Another fairly quiet team this trade period, uh, the West Coast Eagles. They did a little bit more than St Kilda and Sydney. So I at least will go into a little bit of detail discussing this. But again, not a whole lot. So this off-season, only one player joined the Eagles and only one player left. Uh, they welcomed Jaden Hunt as an unrestricted free agent while they parted ways with Junior Rioli. They have four first and second round picks, um, so they've got a few to choose at the top. Um, yeah, they got rid of pick two um, because apparently this isn't as top-heavy of a draft, so some later first round and second round picks perhaps are the best option to go with here so maybe i i originally thought they sort of lost out that big four-way trade but maybe they didn't uh yeah so not not a massive trade period for west coast but i don't think it's been a uh, failure so i'll be giving west coast a c plus uh, i think it was slightly above satisfactory uh 
they did pretty well at managing their draft picks. They welcomed Jaden Hunt, who I think will be a decent player. They part of ways with Gina Rioli, who I think is a fairly decent player, but yeah. And not a whole lot of action, but I, I give them a pass. The Bulldogs are the final team I'll be talking about today. Uh, they were involved in quite a bit of action uh, right from the start to the very finish um, with departing players and joining players. So yeah, there's a fair bit to talk about for the final team. So this trade period, the Bulldogs welcomed Liam Jones and Rory Lobb. Uh, Liam Jones is an extremely good pickup for them. They got him basically for free. Uh, he was a free agent. He, well, he retired. Uh, earlier in the year um, because of the COVID vaccine mandate but that's been lifted now so he decided to join with the dogs they also got Rory Lobb I don't really think he'll do much to be honest I don't think they actually need Rory Lobb but Liam Jones considering how bad their backline is uh, he is an extremely good pickup they parted ways with Zane Cordy who uh, well Zane Cordy leaving uh, cancelled out the uh compensation or I should say Liam Jones joining cancelled out compensation for Zane Cordy leaving uh, Lockie Hunter Josh Shackey also left as well as their best and fairest winner Josh Dunkley so yeah big big trade period uh, Josh Dunkley is a massive loss obviously he was the best and fairest winner this year for the dogs he was their best player this year by a, a mile um, they don't have a particularly strong draft hand yeah, just a lot of action all round, um, a lot of big players joining and a lot of big players leaving. So I'm going to give the Dogs a, a D grade. I think they lost more than they gained. Um, Rory Lomp I don't think is going to be useful at all. Um, they already have enough key forwards there really. Um, Liam Jones is very good but losing the best and fairest winner um, after he wanted to trade uh, he wanted out before, uh, but up until now he wasn't allowed out. He was came out of contract this year, and he decided to leave. So that's that's a very big loss for them, Josh Dunkley, and I think it cancels out the uh, the people they brought in. Uh, they also lost Lockie Hunter and Josh Shackey, uh, who are handy players uh, for depth, uh, particularly Lockie Hunter as well as Zane Cordy. But yeah. So I, I, I think they lost more than they gained. So now that we have discussed every team's trade period, that will wrap up the video. I hope you did enjoy. Um, give me your thoughts on everyone's trade period, uh, who you thought were the biggest winners and the biggest losers. Um, uh, if you did like this video, then be sure to leave a like and subscribe. And I will hopefully see you all in the next one. Bye.